Advanced Studio Classroom is on the air. Let's go traveling. Hi everyone, welcome to Advanced Studio Classroom. And we are here to talk about traveling, one of my favorite topics, and also a favorite topic of the two panelists who are here with me. Hello everybody, this is Josh, and I'm very excited to be here talking to you about travel, which is also one of my favorite subjects. And my name is Brandon, and I'm ready to take a trip, Linda. There's so many places we're going to talk about today, and it makes me want to plan my own vacation. Where would you go? I would like to go to Europe. Okay. You haven't been to no, Europe before, never. right? And I fortunately was able to be an exchange student in Europe, and so I lived in Germany for two years. And in Germany, it is very easy to travel to the rest of Europe, and I took mm. as much opportunity as I could to be able to do so. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> and I too, I've been to Europe a couple of times. It is a wonderful place to visit. So today and tomorrow, we're going to take you around the world, actually. We're going to take you to three different continents. And today, we're going to mostly focus on Europe, and you will see some of the cities that this article recommends. If you are a first-time traveler or an international traveler, these are great choices to go to. And some of us have been to some of these places, and we can attest that they are. But I think no matter where you travel, it's fun. You know, there's mm. always... Um, things to learn and yeah. see and do. But I think some places are definitely easier to go to if it's your first time overseas. Right. You and know? that's why they're yeah. giving these right. recommendations sure. and for a lot of different sure. reasons. Mm -hmm. Yes, because some places would be particularly difficult. Mm -hmm. But So if you're just starting out going overseas, these may be some places you could check out. Right. Well, let's open our magazines to page 26 and um, our Find It on Your Digital Device. We're going to do a couple of different readings here. So we are going to start in the left-hand column on page 26 of your magazine and read down through the middle of the second column. Tackling your first trip overseas. Some of the best cities for first-time international travelers. International travel is crucial toward broadening one's worldview and enjoying life. Understandably, though, if you've never traveled abroad, it can be a bit daunting. To help you out, we've compiled a list of the 10 best places to get your feet wet when it comes to cultural immersive international travel. Barcelona, Spain. Barcelona is one of the most tourist-friendly cities in the world. And it's home to ancient neighborhoods like Bari Gotique and El Born, which date back to the 13th century. Barcelona is also home to both the Picasso Museum and MACBA, Barcelona Museum of Contemporary Art, which mounts cutting-edge contemporary art exhibitions. With a dizzying array of indie boutiques and designer stores, plus a food scene that covers everything from traditional tapas to Michelin star dining, there's never a lack of things to do. So we see our title here, Tackling Your First Trip Overseas. If you tackle something, what do you do, Brandon? Well, that means you go for it. You tackle your first trip. You're actually going to go on your first trip and go through through that. And also, tackling is something we use in a U.S. sport, American football. You tackle a player, right, and you bring them down. So you're kind of, you're, you're accomplishing something. Right. And another way we could talk about tackling sometimes is we'll say you can tackle a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a problem, and you tackle it and figure out what the solution is going to be. 
And I think that's one of the reasons they use it in the title here, because it's, it says here that some of the best cities for first-time international travelers. And if you haven't traveled internationally before, maybe it is kind of a scary thought. Mm. And so this is to help you obtain that, you know, that um, and you know, go for as Brandon mm-hmm. said, go for it or meet the uh, challenges mm. and begin to travel. Sure. And so they're suggesting that these are uh, good cities to go for. Sometimes, as you said earlier, Brandon, it's some places are not as easy for mm-hmm. first time or even maybe seasoned. We say seasoned travelers for people who've traveled a lot. Uh, they're more challenging. These seem to be more internationally friendly. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, and so they will probably offer many services that will help you or just be easier to get around. Maybe it's more similar to where you're from, in a sense. If you're from an international city, things will translate more easily, hopefully. Yeah. I think they, they – well, they talk about several different aspects of first-time travel that uh, will help people. So let's take a look and see what they have to say. Josh, that you've done a lot of international travel. Do you agree with that first sentence that it's crucial toward broadening your mind or your worldview and joining life? I do. Uh, I know that there are a lot of people out there who enjoy traveling and would also say the same thing is that now, obviously, there are many ways to broaden your mind. Um, You can do a lot of things in order to see what's out there in the world. But there's a little bit of a difference between reading about something and seeing representations of it on a movie mm. or in film mm-hmm. and actually going and experiencing it for yourself. So a lot of times when you're hearing about something, you're seeing it on film, you're seeing somebody else's image of it, right? But when you go and see it for yourself and you really get a, a real experience of what it's, what it's like, what it sounds like, what it feels like, what the people are like, it really does allow you to broaden your understanding of life in other places on the planet. I think before you even begin to travel, you have to start opening up your mind and mm-hmm. realizing that where you're going or what you're going to see, it's not wrong. Sure. You know, there's no right or wrong in these kind of situations. It's just different, and it's different from what you're used to. Yeah. So it fits that culture, and it allows us to come into, you know, close proximity with how different cultures live. And it's always good to get a different perspective Mm -hmm. on life because Mm -hmm. sometimes you live in your own world and that world is sometimes very small if you don't learn new things or go new places and uh, see things from a different perspective. Right. So if you haven't ever traveled abroad, though, it can be a bit daunting or scary, as we said. Have you ever met a daunting situation (laughs) <laughs> well, yes. I mean, I moved from the U.S. over to Asia, and so that definitely is daunting. It was a daunting, you know, task, experience. And so you grow in those situations, though. So don't always shy away from them. Sometimes we need to welcome them. Right. I think the big, you know, the number one piece of advice I would give you is not to be afraid. Mm-hmm. I think that's a very good piece of advice. Um, I would say... Um, Every time that I've moved to another part of the world where I really had no background in the language and no real idea of what was going to happen to me, maybe just sort of like, you know, some expectations and some hopes, but that's about it. It was always slightly scary, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but also very exciting. But Mm -hmm. if I'd been afraid, then I wouldn't have been able to experience the excitement. Right. And fear often keeps us from doing something that maybe we desire to do. So, you know, it we sometimes have to overcome that a little bit and go on with it. And um, this article, actually, the authors of this article have made a list, they say, of 10 places. Compiled a list just means to make a list of something. They collected information from different places around the world about different cities and put it all together to help us get our feet wet. That's right. And if you get your feet wet, that means you experience something new. And so, again, we're talking about going overseas for the first time um, or going to some, you know, an international, you know, city. So basically going overseas. And so that's something new. So you're getting your feet wet. Okay. And the first place we're going to go is Barcelona, Spain. Now, Josh, have you, you've been to Spain? I have been to Spain. And I've been to Barcelona. Uh, When I was living in Europe, I took the chance in order to travel all the way to the coast, and I did make it as far as 
Portugal. But when I was in Spain, um, I loved every place I was uh, in Spain. Um, mm. I went. Um, all of the major cities were completely different, fantastic, and Barcelona was no exception. It was a uh, um, very unique. It had a lot of people from different areas, so it felt very international, and I thought it was a great place to visit. Do you agree with this first sentence that it's one of the most tourist-friendly cities in the world? I would say yes. Um, Barcelona has a lot to offer. It has a lot of history. It has a lot of art. It is the home of Picasso, as it says here in the article. And uh, people are really very genuinely happy to share what they have there with people from around the world. Oh, that's great. That's the kind of atmosphere that you want when you're taking a trip. And, you know, maybe you're a little nervous about being in a different mm -hmm. culture. So it's mm -hmm. good to know that there are welcoming cities. It's true. Mm -hmm. And we see that there are ancient neighborhoods that you can explore that go back to the 13th century in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. I always like going to those areas in different cities when we travel because mm -hmm. they're just so different, yes. especially if you go, you know, well, in Asia also there are ancient cities we can yeah. visit. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Europe, Europe has... There's quite a different feel to it in yeah. the neighborhoods. The architecture is always so interesting. It's like you're going back in time. I love to just look at the architecture, walk around and look at buildings and just take in that feeling. Right. And we see here also that, as Josh said, it's home to both the Picasso Museum, because it is the home of Picasso, and the Barcelona Museum of Contemporary Art. So you're getting, well, Picasso was quite a progressive artist for his time, quite a different style, right? Very different style. Uh, a lot of people would say that he sort of fathered the Cubist mm -hmm. movement, which is a very abstract way of representing people and landscapes, but uh, became very popular and has inspired a lot of artists. So we think we often think of him as a contemporary artist. It's true. Mm -hmm. And so we also have the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art, and I like this, the way they say this next section, which mounts cutting-edge contemporary art exhibitions. Mm -hmm. So when you read that, what does that mean? Well, first of all, that word mount, you think of mounting something on the wall, usually a, um, a picture or something, and we are talking about here an art museum, so they're using that word maybe kind of uh, playfully or uh, ironically. So they're, they're mounting cutting-edge contemporary art exhibitions. So, what is cutting edge? Yes, cutting edge is something that is new, I would say, mm -hmm. or something, yeah, trendy. Cutting edge, contemporary in our time period, art exhibitions. And so if you go to an exhibition there, it should be something that is new, you know, and uh, yeah, that's basically what it's saying. Mm -hmm. Did you go to MACBA when you were there or not? Unfortunately, I did not. I was with a group of people who, um, so Barcelona in Spain in general, is very active in the evening time. And oh, it's yeah. a culture where people, they love to go out to eat, they love to go to, out to dance, they love to go out to socialize. And so most things in Spain really get started when the sun goes down and they'll go until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. So the people that I was with were very interested in enjoying that part of Spanish culture. So we didn't get much of a chance in order to go around and see stuff during the day. Okay. Well, not only do they have the Picasso Museum and Contemporary Art Museum here, they also have a dizzying array of indie boutiques and designer stores. And if you have a dizzying array of something, it means you have a wide variety. Yeah, there's so much, you're <laughs> kind of, you can't take it all in, right? Right. It kind of makes you dizzy, so to speak. Yeah. I don't know. If it comes to shopping, I maybe could take it all in. <laughs> <laughs> and we see this word indie boutiques, and indie here, that's kind of a, uh, really a buzzword that you'll hear a lot, indie music and things like that, and it just means independent. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? So they aren't um, big chain stores, you know, they're mm -hmm. individually owned and probably have kind of very interesting, um, you know, set our choice of clothing right. or whatever they're selling. And it's usually, usually referring to, if not always, artistic work or music or like music or films or something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Generally, when you see that word, it is. Mm -hmm. But here, boutiques just means mm -hmm. they are definitely selling right. something. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, they also could be fairly unique, right? right. So what mm -hmm. you would find in one store, you would be hard to find in other mm -hmm. places. And they also have designer stores as well. And they have a food scene. 
Mm. Which sounded pretty interesting because they have uh, they have Michelin star dining and they have tapas. And did you have top? You did you oh, have both when you I, were there? So um, I was traveling a little bit on a budget, and Michelin star dining is so a food review restaurant and hotel review company that uh, usually reviews uh, fantastic foods that tend to also be expensive. Mm-hmm. Now there are some. Uh, restaurants that might get a Michelin star that aren't super expensive, uh, but they're fairly rare. Mm. Um, but for us, while we were there, we were traveling on a budget, and there was no reason for us to go for fancy food because there were tapas restaurants all over the place. And a tapas is a small, if you would think of something like an appetizer mm-hmm. style, so a plate, small foods, unique flavors, and it's designed so that you get many different kinds, and then you share them with everyone at the table. Mm -hmm. And it's a Mm -hmm. wonderful way to enjoy company because you'll have small little Mm bite-sized, fantastic foods that are uh, designed really to help uh, people just sit and enjoy each other's company. Mm. Have you had hot tapas before? I have not, but now I want to try it. Yeah, it's very fun. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. If you have an opportunity to have that that style of food, I would recommend that you try it. You'll love it. And there are also tapas restaurants around the world, so you don't necessarily yeah. have to go to yeah. Spain. Mm-hmm. And so anytime that you hear of a tapas restaurant, you should give it a try regardless of where it's at. And there is a good chance that it might be run by someone from Spain. Yeah. Hmm. Well, let's uh, continue on our journey around the world. We're going to go now to a country next door to Spain. So let's read uh, through the end of this section. Lisbon, Portugal. Lisbon is currently one of the most popular cities for travelers to Europe, and with good reason. The city has an infectiously laid-back way of life that leaves most travelers green with envy. Packed tightly over seven steep hills, nearly all of the streets in Lisbon are lined with Portugal's iconic cobblestones. There are buzzing plazas, pastry shops, outdoor markets, and a stunning riverfront that's made for a romantic stroll. The -the easy-on-the-wallet cost of hotel rooms, food, and drinks only sweeten the deal. And plenty of the people you meet will speak at least some English. Copenhagen, Denmark Thankfully, the people of Copenhagen supplement their Danish with near fluency in English. The city's cuisine is the stuff of legend. You can start your day with the morgme, a series of tiny delicious plates, and follow it up with smorbrel, open-faced sandwiches for lunch. Burning off those calories by strolling the eminently walkable streets is a first-time traveler's delight as well. Navan is the oft-photographed canal lined with brightly colored houses and sidewalk cafes. Well, now we're in the country next door to Barcelona, Spain. We're in Lisbon, Portugal. And here we see that, I didn't know this, but it's currently one of the most popular cities for travelers to Europe, and there's a good reason for that. Do you Mm -hmm. want to go to Portugal? Sure. Why not? Okay. It's not it's not really on my list, but it looks like an interesting place to go. Well, what does it say? What is the good reason for it being so popular, Brandon? It's laid back, infectiously laid back. That means when you go there, maybe you will be laid back as well. It will infect you. <laughs> yes. Right. And it's a way of life, right? That's a what... way of life. So it's uh, more than just a way that people like enjoy. It's really the entire culture takes on this sort of laid back feel. And really, when I was there, I was infected. <laughs> <laughs> you were really laid back, right? I was really laid back. <laughs> so I had gone there on a trip. We had wanted originally to go visit many areas of Portugal, but we made it to the coast and we ended up in a small coast town. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Uh, the accommodation was very cheap. The The town itself, the people were fantastic. We ended up just not going anywhere else because we enjoyed ourselves so much there. 
So that is definitely the laid back way of life. Exactly. And it says it leaves most travelers green with envy. When I, you know, when I travel, I vacillate between wanting to like totally relax and be laid back and seeing everything <laughs> in that city. Mm. I kind of drive my husband nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm like, I'm so afraid I'm going to miss something right. really cool. Right, right, right. But then yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, we should relax a little bit. <laughs> a balance is good, right? <laughs> yeah, it's sometimes hard when you, you know, when there's so much to see and do. But I think you can see and do it in a laid back style. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and here it says it leaves most travelers green with envy. Yeah, so when they're, they're there, they see people so laid back and they feel, oh, I want to be like that too. I want to be like this all the time maybe. And so they feel they're very envious of these people. Unless you're Josh and you just become like them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, well, we see that uh, Lisbon is uh, built over seven steep hills. So you're like walking uphill mm. a lot if Good you're exercise. going to be walking around. Mm-hmm. Yes. And they are they are made of or lined with Portugal's iconic cobblestones. So cobblestone, when we talk about cobblestone streets, boy, that really mm. makes you feel like you're in days gone by. Yes. It's Just, true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's cobblestones are a way, like a cobble is actually a specific size of stone. Um, but they're not uniform. They're uh, smooth and they're round-ish. Um, but they uh, have been used you know, in the past in order to pave lots of areas, and of course, they're still around today. Um, they're very uneven, and sometimes they're a little bit difficult to walk on when they're wet. But it definitely does remind you that you're in a place that has uh, a long history. Right. Mm. And if something is iconic, it means it's what? Well, when you see it, it brings an image to mind because you've seen it so much. So when I think of cobblestone, for example, you think of that old style street or whatever. And so it immediately is something that you know. Right. And and I think to go along with the cobblestone streets also, it means that the surrounding buildings also must be older because you're not going to build, you know, a brand new apartment building, say, on a cobblestone mm, street. That's true. Because mm-hmm. it wouldn't go together right. also. Mm-hmm. You know, you you can be in this entire atmosphere of history. Yeah. But it also says that there are buzzing plazas and lots of other things. What does it really what what does it really suggest that we do when we're in Lisbon, Josh? Well, it suggests that you go out and enjoy the uh, outdoor markets and the street food. Okay, and they also have pastry shops mm. and um, a riverfront. So there must there's a river that goes through Lisbon that you can take a romantic stroll along if you would like to. And buzzing plazas, that just means they're quite busy. Yes. Mm-hmm. So it sounds it, like fun. It does. It does I, I want to go fun. after really? reading this. Yes, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> and also, it's not expensive. The way they phrase mm-hmm. it here is quite interesting, that easy on the wallet cost. Right. So that means it's not very expensive. The hotel rooms are reasonable, I guess, and also the food and drinks, um, not too bad, pretty inexpensive. And so it sweetens the deal. Or I guess it's saying really the rooms are cheap, but the food and drinks add to the experience. It sweetens the deal. I don't know what the cost of the food is there. It might be expensive to you. It might be inexpensive. I don't know. Where I was at, I really felt like everything was very reasonably priced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you use this phrase to sweeten the deal, it just means that you're getting a good deal on the hotels. And so to even make it better, okay, Mm -hmm. is the food and the drink here. Sometimes we say sweeten the pot, the same idea, Mm -hmm. add to something to um, make you want to do something. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I want to sell you something, I can add something else to it to make you want it even more to sweeten the deal Mm -hmm. or the pot. And and also, you know, it uh, says that a lot of people there speak some English, so... You can practice your English while you're there. Yeah. And, you know, it'll, you'll kill two birds with one stone. You'll mm. travel and practice English. Well, now we're going to travel to another part of Europe. We're going up uh, to Copenhagen, Denmark. I, have either one of you been here? I have been to Copenhagen. It's a beautiful place. I, anybody who is interested should go. Can you say something more? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really difficult to say about Copenhagen because there's so many things going on there. Um, Danish people are very friendly. Um, they are very, very, very uh, um, uh, open to foreigners. The waterfront, the building, the people, the food is all it feels very unique. And there's certainly there's 
there's nothing we can do in Copenhagen that it's not going to be interesting. Mm. Oh, okay, another oh. place. I haven't been to Copenhagen. <laughs> I would like to go there. And for one reason is is their city's cuisine is the stuff of legend. Did you like the food? I love the food. Um, they're really big on small pieces of fantastic breads covered mm. with like uh, um, uh, a unique cheese or a uh, tasty meat. So it's uh, or something like a savory jam. It's it's a whole wide array, and they're very tasty. Once again, also bite sized, but they also have um, uh, bigger meals as well. Okay, so stuff of legend means it's very famous mm -hmm. and talked about. And we see that besides these tiny plates of food that uh, Josh was describing, they serve open-faced sandwiches for lunch. Actually, I love open-faced sandwiches. I love bread, so it sounds like the place for me to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so after Lisbon, then you can fly yes. directly to Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, and then we see that after you have now eaten all of this delicious food, you can stroll um, on the eminently walkable streets. Yes, and so these streets, they probably don't have a lot of traffic, and so it's just a place for people, for pedestrians to take a walk. Yeah, and they also do a lot of bicycling in Denmark, and so it's very friendly for uh, people who are not in cars or motorcycles to be able to get around. So mm -hmm. you certainly will be burning off the calories you ate earlier. Very and true. we see here, if you look just above, if you have your magazine, you can see a picture of this canal and... Uh, all the brightly colored houses and sidewalk cafes along there. It just seems so appealing. Mm. Like you'd like to sit and have some coffee and a pastry. Yes, and, or two. <laughs> or two. <laughs> or two. <laughs> and, all right, fine. And um, enjoy the, the pedestrians and enjoy the scenery out over this canal. Well, we have some other areas of the world we're going to take you to tomorrow as we travel overseas, so we hope you will join us then. But for now, this is Linda, Brandon, and Josh saying goodbye. Goodbye. goodbye.